Greetings. So today we're talking about Kendall Walton's fiction and nonfiction, which is an excerpt from his 1990 uh, book, My Mises as Make-Believe, on the foundations of the representational arts. And in this section, uh, Walton wants to highlight the differences between uh, fiction and nonfiction. Can we clearly delineate any, any borderline uh, between these two concepts, right? And so Walton is going to advance a thesis that he calls the make-believe uh, theory. Uh, and the make-believe theory is that we can draw a distinction, although it's a, he notes there are borderlands, as he calls them, between fiction and, and nonfiction. Like, for example, uh, certain uh, historical works from, say, the 17th and 18th century that, that blur that line. Uh, nevertheless, he thinks there is a, a clear distinction that we can suss out, right? Okay, so what then is the difference, right? Um, well, to illustrate this, Walton gives us an example. You imagine, imagine there, are, there are three people in the woods and they're playing a little game, right? Uh, and the people are Eric, Gregory, and Susan. And they stipulate a rule. Anytime you see a tree stump, we're going to imagine that's a bear, right? So, uh, you know, this is just part of the little game they're playing, right? Now, um, we can imagine them, imagine them imagining, right, that they're in the forest and they're playing this game, and there might be a tree stump that, you know, is, is hidden in a, in a culvert, or, or not a culvert, but a, uh, uh, a ravine or something like that that they don't see, right? So that's, a, that's an imagined bear that isn't, you know, that they could or would be in, in principle an imagined bear, but they don't see it, right? Um, these tree stumps... Walton argues they act as what he calls props, right? And props, he tells us, this is the bottom of page 136 of your text. Uh, props are generators of fictional truths, things which, by virtue of their nature or existence, make propositions fictional. A snow fort is a prop. It is responsible for the fictionality of the proposition that there is a real fort with turrets and a moat. A doll makes it fictional in a girl's game that there's a a baby girl, right? So props make, they generate, as he puts it, they generate a fictional truth, right? Um, now he goes on to, to elaborate on it. He elaborates, props generate fictional truths independently of what anyone does or does not imagine, but they do not do so entirely of their own, apart from any uh, actual or potential imaginers. Props function only in a social or at least human setting. The stump in the thicket makes it fictional that a bear is there only because there is a certain convention, understanding, agreement in the game of make-believe. One to the effect that wherever there is a stump, fictionally there is a bear. I will call this the principle of generation. Right? So this principle is is generated. It's created by you know an explicit decree. All right, listen. Whenever we see stumps, we're going to declare them to be bears, right? We're to imagine they're going to be bears, right? So in a way, right, fiction seems to be a kind of convention. We all agree. All right, um, this mound that we made out of snow is going to be a fort. This tree stump is going to be a bear, right? Um, this broom in my hand is going to be a guitar, right? Now, Walton goes on to qualify this somewhat, right? Some, including most involving works of art, are never explicitly agreed on or even formulated, and imaginers may be unaware of them, at least in the sense of being unable to spell them out, right? I do not assume the principles of generation are, in general, or even normally, conventional or arbitrary, nor that they must be learned. Nevertheless, what principles of generation there are depends on what, on which people, or, excuse me, Nevertheless, which, what principles of generation there are depends on which ones people accept in various contexts. The principles that are in force are those that are to be understood, at least implicitly, to be in force, right? And he goes on to note, prompts, props, excuse me, not props, props are often prompters or objects of imagining also, right? So he, he notes that, you know, this is a... a a preface, if you will, right, to his more general theory. He hasn't gotten to that yet, right? Um, it's still unclear, right, uh, how these props actually generate fictionality. So he, he elaborates on that. Um, 
he he notes here the margin of page 137 excuse me the second paragraph uh, second column on 137 we know that being fictional is not the same as being imagined and we have seen how some fictional truths are established by props working in conjunction with principles of generation but what is thus established the answer will emerge when we consider what connections do obtain between fictionality and imagination imagining is easily thought of as a free unregulated activity subject to no constraints save whim happenstance and the obscure demands of the unconscious, right? Beliefs, unlike imaginings, are correct or incorrect. Beliefs aim at truth. What is true, and only what is true, is to be believed. Belief aims at truth, right? We are not free to believe as we please. We are free, however, to imagine as we please. But... He goes on to note, Walton goes on to note, that even imagination is constrained. I can, I can imagine squaring the circle, but for all my mental effort, I can't square a circle in my imagination no matter how I try, right? So our imagination, then, is limited by experience. Um, and Walton goes on to note, a fictional truth consists in there being a prescription or mandate in some context to imagine something. Fictional propositions are propositions that are to be imagined, whether or not they are in fact imagined, right? The agreements which participants in a collective daydream make about what to imagine can be thought of as rules prescribing certain imaginings, right? And anyone who refuses to imagine what is agreed upon, like say we sit in a box and imagine we're in a starship, right? Then they're refusing to play the game. They break the rule, right? The fictionality, however, right? of the proposition that there is a bear at a certain place consists in the fact that imagining it, the tree stump to be a bear, is prescribed by a rule of game. The rule is conditional. It's prescription dependent on the presence of a stump. Thus, this, this, thus does the stump generate the fictional truth. Fictionality has turned out to be analogous to truth in some ways. The relation between fictionality and imagining parallels that, um, and imagining, excuse me, parallels that between truth and belief. Imagining aims at a at the fictional as belief aims at the true. What is true is to be believed, and what is fictional is to be imagined, right? So, we now have, seemingly, a a, a loose criteria, right? Again, because it is, as Walton knows, there are borderlands, as he calls them, right? Uh, but we have a criteria for dis distinguishing fiction and, and, and belief, right? Beliefs aim at truth, whereas fiction... Uh, fiction is to be imagined, right? And he elaborates on this in, in a uh, discussion of nonfiction on page 139. He notes, We thus find ourselves with a way of distinguishing fiction from nonfiction. Works of fiction are simply representations in our special sense, works whose function is to serve as props and games of make believe. Except for the fact that representations need not be works, human artifacts, and important facts, as we, as we shall see. We could use representation and works of fiction interchangeably. So, it's interesting to think that you know uh, you're reading a book and you, you're confronting you're confronted with props, right? So you know Tolkien tells us that Gandalf uh, has a long beard and broad shoulders, right? Um, presumably, Walton would say, well, that's a prop. Right, um, he elaborates. Uh, any work with the function of serving as a prop in games of make believe, however minor or peripheral or instrumental this function might be, qualifies as fiction. Only what lacks this function entirely will be called nonfiction. Right. In concluding this line of thought, he tells us it is important to consider this way of understanding fiction against the backdrop of alternatives. Right. So he notes that there are, there are competing theories, but he ultimately thinks these, they just, they blur the line and they don't allow for a clear demarcation. Now, again, there are, there are borderland cases as he, as he says, right? But he thinks his fiction or his, excuse me, his theory of fiction helps to distinguish the two in a way that is useful, uh, for us and, and helps to, um, suss out exactly what the, the precise difference is between these, you know, the concepts of fiction and reality.